Three, two, one. Boom. Welcome, everyone, um, to another show of Real Drug Talk. Now, it's been a little bit of time since we've had an episode because I was just saying to our guest uh, for today, guest, sounds so weird calling me a guest. <laughs> um, uh, but, yeah, I was just saying to Lily today, who I'll introduce in a second, that, um, yeah, we've been in the background building a bunch of stuff um, and that's taken all our energy and we haven't really done any of the podcast or YouTube channel or anything like that. So we're excited to get it ramped back up um, and, yeah, excited about today because um, we've got uh, Lily um, with us to share her story. A very interesting story, actually, and I won't kind of steal the uh, spotlight too much. I'll let her kind of talk about herself and everything that's gone on. But how are you, mate? What's happening? Good. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for having me. No worries. Now, for everyone listening, um, we're both actually in Melbourne. So we're still in this kind of like Zoom universe, COVID-19 thing. Um, so we're doing the best that we can. Um, but I guess I want to focus on, because the feedback that we've had from the last shows, Lil, is that people love the personal stories um, yep. so than anything. And um, so, yeah, we're keen to kind of hear your personal experience, but tell us a little bit about yourself. Like what, what uh, got you interested in working in this space now? But um, yeah, tell us a bit about your story. So I, um, yeah, I'm working in the harm reduction sector here in, um, in Melbourne. Um, also a bit of work um, doing counseling and recovery coaching with connection-based living. But what got me interested was I saw um, through my own experience of um, drug dependency, methamphetamine addiction, what was available and what wasn't available and how yeah. hard it was for, for me to, how hard it was for me to access any help. Um, and, you know, I, I, from the get-go, from the moment I had a little inkling that I could get uh, addicted to meth, I knew that I needed to get help early on. Yeah. So I went and, uh, and sought help from a myriad of um, doctors and um, tried to Google, tried to find everything before it became a problem thinking rationally I need some sort of help for my anxiety. I kind of was self-aware at that point. Yeah. And then I saw, and it was really hard to get help. So you were super aware from before from it was even like fully out of control that this could be a real thing yeah. in your life. hundred wow. percent. 100%. Yeah. So I thought if I can't get help and I've got support around me, I'm really lucky. I've got family. I've got friends. I've yeah. had a good education. Um, but this drug is getting getting me, you know. It's really, it's hooked me. Yeah. It's starting to hook me. I think I can get out if I actually uh, can attack the and approach and nurture the underlying issues. But anyway, I, I saw how hard it was to get help. Um, and from that point, I think subconsciously something started um, sort of plotting underneath of me needing to um, work in this field. Um, but it wasn't until fast forward four years later, three, three and a half years later, yeah. um, where I was, I'd relapsed and I was um, back um, using and I was researching all about harm reduction, all about um, the harm minimization model overseas and the success it was having and, you know, people needing purpose in their life. Um, yeah. And it was at that point I was like, okay, I've got to stop this because this is like, I'm going to lose my mind. Yeah. I'm going to lose everything I've got, everything. I've, I've, I've lost everything, but I hadn't lost my mind. And I was yeah. like, I just know that this is sort of like a bit of a, it just felt like, call it psychosis, whatever yeah. it might be, yeah. <laughs> some sort of message that came in. And I was like, I have to stop using and I need to start helping in the field. So that's when I booked back into rehab and that's when it was the end. Awesome. Um, and then, yeah, it was sort of like, I kept trying to resist it, kept trying to resist that I wanted to help in the field. And then I remember sitting in my car, like it was raining, I was on Hunt Road or something and it was like, what if I was on my deathbed, what is it that I'd want to be doing? And um, I think because I was like kicking I'm back and I was sober and I was kicking goals with um, uh, interior design. Yeah. Just been promoted, promoted, being sent overseas. And I was like, yeah, this is awesome. But there was a hole, you know, there's a gap. 
Yeah. And so it was like, I asked myself, what would it be? Um, what would I want to do um, if I was on my deathbed? And it was like, I want to help drug addicts. And I was like, no. <laughs> 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 but um, <laughs> that, that was it. And I was like, okay, well, and then from there, my life's just exponentially got better and better and better. Love it. So, yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. And I really want to kind of explore that a bit more because uh, I think that it's an interesting point. Like, but by all means, I always say to people, like, just because you have problems with alcohol and drugs doesn't mean that you have to become a drug and alcohol worker or help people mm. in the field or whatever. But if you do have an inkling to do it, it's really fucking cool if you do because, mm. yeah, it's, like, really powerful when you bring your experience to it. So it's awesome. And I know that... Like, that's the other thing I like about you um, and I think it's really interesting is that, you know, you are successful in other areas and kind of a normal person, look cool, um, you know, intelligent, all that stuff. Um, and it's a breath of fresh air and it's something that people can get, like, really inspired by and, and things like that. So no. even though you were, like, getting promotions and going overseas in another field and career you kind of went, nah, this is not the thing. It's pretty amazing. Well, yeah, it's kind of mad. Like I remember um, going back to visiting a friend in rehab at a rehab that I went to. Yeah. And um, the owner said to me, oh, you know, how's the interior design? How's that? I was like, good, but I'm studying counselling. She's like, why? <laughs> why would you do that? <laughs> I was like, I know. She's like, what? Do, it's crazy. She's like, I'd be so interested to see what it takes someone you know, you've now got away from the addict, well, away from the addiction. You know, you've got this new life and start, you know, you're back doing your creative things. And this is why I wanted to, a big reason why I wanted to get off drugs is so that I could have that freedom and have that creativity back and have that way of looking at the world again, you yeah. know, and then to actually go, no, I want need to go back to that world again, yeah. but from a different point of view, I think it just comes from that, um, there's a lot of work to be done in this field. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I want to do it. Yeah. No. I want to make shit happen. <laughs> I love it. When I talk to you about it, I, I get excited because, um, yeah, I relate to it. You kind of fresh, think about things differently. It's really mm. cool. So um, I want to get into all of that recovery stuff a little bit later and just kind of hear how that naturally transformed itself in your life. But how did you... Um, Oh, how did you get to that place? Like, what's your what's your addiction story? Give us so, the, uh, the so <laughs> I am um, like growing up, I was a real um, nerd. Loved loved school. Um, yeah. I definitely had those people pleasing tendencies of always being like the good girl or the you know um, the funny girl or the perfect girl, or whatever it might be. So I yeah. definitely had these. Um, now I look back on it anxieties and um, uncomfortabilities from like yeah. seven years old or, you know, six, as long as I can, as early as I can remember. Anyway, I never was interested in drugs at school. Other kids would um, do drugs. I just never really was in, I was never interested. And then um, it, I had a, stuff was going on at home. Um, yeah. And I, there was definitely a time where I just stopped caring. So it was probably just like just before I finished school and I was like, give me the drugs, give me the... So it was a real escapism yeah. thing. Um, so how old was that, sorry? Probably like 17, 18. Yep. Um, but I wasn't... It, it was pretty <laughs> normal, but... Yeah, you um, were still having fun at that time. having fun, but, yeah. you know, it was definitely like... I definitely had this... No, like I was definitely very naughtier than my other friend like I wanted to stay up I was definitely like <laughs> wanted to stay up longer and yeah, be yeah, more yeah. dangerous with the types of drugs I was using and just like no no shit's given definitely pushed the envelope from when I you know yeah um then anyway it came up um fast forward a couple of years I was just like partying and having fun and then we we um then um meth and heroin got introduced to our kick-ons and yeah. um I remember at that point being like, uh oh, someone's gonna go down. Yeah. Fast forward, like six of us went down. Yeah. Um, so 
Um, I got a really, I was, I had a lot of focus on work. So it was quite good. I was like, okay, I know that there's like meth every weekend. I didn't like it that much, but would always do it. And I knew that either my boyfriend was going to get hooked or, you know, one of us was going to get hooked. And I thought it would probably be myself or my boyfriend at the time because we yeah. were both like the naughty ones. Naughty, yeah. Not the naughty, but like we liked to. We you liked were going for it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We were in that, like, you know, just I, I get it. headspace. So then um, I um, uh, decided to start get a job in Sydney. Wow. So moved, he moved with me. We, we both got jobs, moved to Sydney um, to get away from the math. And I think I wanted to get away from my family and, you know, all of that sort of thing. I was going to say, was the thinking behind that to kind of get away? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was like, if we yeah. get away from the kick-ons, we won't have meth. I hate meth. It's the worst. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Also, GHB was around. We were just like blowing out all the time. It was getting really dangerous. Um, and then, so I we went to Sydney. First night, we go out. And we're like, oh, let's go and listen to some techno or something. And then let's go find some MDMA. Yeah. Oh, straight to King's, King's uh, Cross. <laughs> I got the meth, you know? So it was like, Luxurious. oh shit, well, like we couldn't <laughs> find the MDMA. So we just had to get meth, you know? Yeah. And then that sort of was every weekend. And then it went from Thursday to the Monday. And then it was, you know, dregs of the, you know, anyway, just like, it was just, it just continued that, that yeah. way. So I was um, definitely um, emotionally pretty broken by that stage from stuff yep. that had happened from when I was about 16 to that point, it would have been 22. Yeah. Um, and had, so I discovered drugs at 16 and mm. nothing had come to the surface, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it was very easy to just keep using because as soon as I'd feel something and it was that kind of use where we'd be like, we'd have to have something every night, whether it be Xanax, whether it be something like we'd, ha we'd yeah. have to just knock ourselves out every night, codeine, cold water extraction. Like it was just this consistent, and it just became really annoying. Like it, everything mm. was just, just trying, to, trying to get something, something, something. So you didn't have to be. Anyway, rapidly, um, I, I got um, pr still at this point getting promoted at work. My boyfriend was also doing really well in his um, field. We had this beautiful apartment overlooking the harbour. It's, this is what always amazes me about people. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, like, no, no. Cause like, as you're explaining, like I, I relate, but I guess my, my story, like just externally in my life, I just couldn't hold shit together and it yeah. just completely fell apart. And I just find it amazing when people, cause it's so common, you know, that people are using like you, but then still the outside trappings are managed, you, you know, you're managing to, hold them together for a it's, period of time it's madness it's like you know i'd wake up in the morning no i'd probably like i'd so i'd go to bed like this was such a routine like i'd go to bed have two hours sleep ready with the crap pipe next to my bed so that i could wake up at like four in the morning and have like <laughs> a great time before i went to work blow dry my hair put my makeup on and like it just put all the masks on every yep. day yeah at work get home business you know it was just this um quite soul eroding wow. lifestyle, you know? Um, and anyway, I am. Um, so then I thought I could do more work and push harder. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I, I thought I'd literally so stupid now that I think about it, but understandable. I thought I'd like clocked life. Like, oh my yeah. God, if I smoke, then I can go and do all my work. I can, be from where I can get all of this stuff and then I can <laughs> get my creative creative outlet. I got back into my art and all of this stuff. Yeah. And then I could spend time with my boyfriend in the middle of the night that yeah. I could never spend, you know, so I was like, clocked it, clocked it until it just, this went on for a while though. Yeah. And then, um, do you think, do you think that's the trap? Like, cause that's, that's the thing that I really see with people and, like when they have a story like yours where they're really successful externally holding it together is that it is kind of like a trap, you know, like they like, because you are able to hold it together for so long and until you're not. And then you, you just think, yeah, I've got this, I've got well, this. You, ro you romanticize it. You yeah. romanticize the idea. And it took me honestly quite a long time in recovery 
to get out of this way of thinking because yeah. it, my like neural pathways had just gone meth equals creativity, meth equals mm. um, creative outlet. You can only be creative when you're on meth. You yeah. can't wake up without it. You can't. So I st- like, I just, then I started using it just as coffee, you know, like as a normal person's coffee, you know, just yeah. so I could be awake. And um, so to get out of that, ha- that habit loop, mm. because it became part of, it wasn't like it was a social thing or it was people I was hanging out with. It was like, it was everything for yeah. me, you know, like it was just, yeah. I couldn't function without it. I didn't want to function without it. Everything was so bland without it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if, so in Melbourne, I went to the, this is before I even went to Sydney. That's when I started going to the doctors. Yeah. And then all throughout this, before, when it was like a, every two weeks, every week, or, you know, it was, so I was very conscious about, okay, it's sneaking in. As much as I like, I, I was like, I easily went in. My thought patterns at that point, I was so scared. I was so scared and I knew that it was about to really get us. And I think that I, at that point had more, um, I, I could have, I know at that point I could have stopped yep. if I had had help. Yeah. If I had the resources that I know now, like I, I just know that I was not, I really knew what was going to happen, but I couldn't stop. Yeah. I couldn't stop. Um, so that's what concerns me about the GP thing. And, you know, I work in the field now. I might yeah. be digressing, but, no. you know, the information that we give out to get help is go and see your GP. Yeah. That's not... I, and, I, the GPs, and the GPs don't know what's going the on. The GPs <laughs> don't know what's going on. There's a lot of stigma around um, people with substance mm. abuse, um, substance use disorders. I got then um, in Melbourne, I got put on... Valium, and then so Valium was my other kryptonite. You know that that was my Achilles. I loved Valium. You know it was my yeah as much as I love this. So it was just very band aid on top of band aid. But um anyway um yeah I was just living such a lie, and I I didn't know what was um, real or I couldn't tell the truth. Yeah. I couldn't I couldn't admit to myself what was going on. I couldn't admit to myself what the situation was with my um, ex-partner. We were madly in love, but, um, and very, like a very innocent love as well, you know, but yeah. there was toxic drugs that were fueling um, our life, you know? Mm. So it, it really created such a division between us. Yeah. Um, and although the love was there, it just started falling apart. And then everything yeah. in my life started sort of falling apart. And, I'm sure he wouldn't, he's in recovery now, which is amazing, awesome. but I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying, but like there were hospital admissions, there were overdoses, like, you know, there was, um, cause he was an opioids man as well. Yeah. There was a lot of that stuff going on and it just became a lot, you know, we were, we couldn't be intimate. It was just this, it was like the devil was in each of us and we yeah. couldn't get past that. So work started falling apart. Bit by bit, not work, not falling apart, but it just cracks were showing. My anxiety was through the roof. Yep. And I think when um, I broke up with him, I it was harder for me to access the drugs. Right. So um, I didn't want to go and take the risks at the scary dealers. House. You know, like I just beca- I just mm. was scared. You know, I was less brave with him. I didn't I didn't want to go out into this big bad world alone yeah. and so then I feel like when the drugs started running out the crate you know like it just hundred percent yeah, <laughs> freak out like I like I do not wish that on upon my worst enemy that feeling like you know it as well yeah and I'm sure that, anyone who's in recovery or using knows that feeling that's so funny that you say that because that's when I look back on my experience as well that's when my life was the worst in my like addiction it was when I couldn't, for whatever reason, it was when I couldn't get enough drugs to kind of make me just feel okay. Mm. And yeah, the onset of the madness in the mind would come on, the overwhelming washing machine fucking feelings, you know, all the stuff. And that's when 
I would kind of go crazy and do really desperate things and just, yeah. It was, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I just so, want to, I just yeah, want to, yeah. I just want to, sorry, I just want to ask you because it's really interesting and I don't know if you mind talking about it, but I think it's a really good insight and something that a lot of people forget about and that I have no idea about because obviously I'm a male. <laughs> um, but it's something that I've heard a few like females talk about when they're in recovery and I don't think it's kind of out there mm. enough. But yeah, like it, it's a whole different ball game in that world using drugs as a female. Mm. Um, and I'm not even talking about running around in kind of the underworld or whatever, like just, just mm. in the drug using culture you, you're obviously like you said you know you don't you don't want to fucking go and hang out with the seedy crack dealer and you know all that stuff like like what's well, it like being a female it's, it's well like thinking from that point then to where i got to mm. um it so it's it's scary and it's dangerous you know i um i got i from that point, there's definitely you're more vulnerable to sexual abuse yeah. um, or um, a lack of stability in self to say no. Mm. Um, and or, you know, like you're just with people that maybe, and this is a generalisation, but from my experience, it's people that don't really respect women, especially women who are using ice. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's, a world that just it it just breeds um, disrespect, disregard. Mm. Because you know, I was disrespecting, disregarding myself. So it's sort of like you're going to be attracted to people that's doing the same thing. So 100%. there was definitely it was scary mm. and um, definitely dangerous. Yeah, I put myself in some unbelievably dangerous situations mm. um, and I really lowered my self-worth and I think that that was almost the worst thing getting um, building my self-esteem back up looking back at what I put that girl through mm. like going back to the same awful guy who but because it was safe or just some, like just people that I would um, they taught me a lot but really took a lot from me, you know, yeah. like my soul, you know, like there was a lot and I allowed that. I'm not, yeah. that was, that was, on, that's on me, but um, it's still like, you know, I'm, I, I understand it now and I'm very proud of now being a woman, not the fragile little girl addicted to ice, but I really um, felt very alone. And like, you know, there was definitely secondary, um, secondary addictions going on like men and you know like mm. I'd put the work obsession aside like I'd already had that I'd always been obsessed with work now that mm. the work had broken down and then um was that addiction needing to be wanted you know needing to be just needing something 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 so I mm. just settle for shit you know yeah. and um and I guess it was that thing of like fast forward a few years, I went to, I got stuck in Cambodia. Um, the police found As all my do. drugs. I had to get, like we got caught by police. Then my friend got um, drugged by the local, um, where are you going to gamble? Casino. Because oh. we, we won all of this money, got um, drugged on GHB. His heart stopped in the hospital. Like there was this huge palaver, which was quite, traumatizing i couldn't get out of the country um then i was um bedridden and hospitalized for two months three months after two like i was bedridden for two months afterwards i was hospitalized in um kuala lumpur where my dad lived i was i weighed wow. my, maybe under 40 kilos i was i had i didn't eat the whole of cambo like I, I just was on a mission to just not didn't care if i lived or died yeah came home from that and that was when my health started getting really bad and I was just like just really unwell so there was no coming back to work or anything like that the relationship yeah. was over the apartment was over the um just all of it was over and I had to move from um 
moved from Sydney back to Melbourne. Um, and then I just, I lived this life of, I didn't have it. I sort of stayed with family, friends and slept in my car. You know, like I really was transient gypsy life for years. Yeah. Um, gypsy life, I like it. <laughs> but still tra- pretending that I still had my shit together. I like started a, um, a jewellery brand and I, because I was doing that. I was doing something, but I was just <laughs> madly trying to use, you know. And I remember um, that was, those years were very traumatic. Um, it was just, yeah, that wild, crazy meth life. Yeah, um, yeah. Dealing with what, like, you know, a, a trauma, I um, a sexual assault um, that had mm. happened a couple of years before and then um, I was so alone like I just felt so alone as a female especially um, and I was lying to my friends and my family but I was lying to myself firstly you know and I, um, I couldn't be honest I couldn't because it was just what do you do like how do you get out of this and I mm. tried to get out of it and it was just it was, it was hell on earth hell yeah. on earth it's um, it is, it's it's horrible, and I think you know the one thing that I've heard people um, or females talk about as well, like which is what you're describing, is it? It's kind of this old, it's kind of this old, strange, um, underlying societal like narrative as well around like probably drug use in particular, that um, you know, like in the movies and stuff, like with like men using drugs, like it's not really acceptable for anyone, I suppose, but in movies and things like that, it's often romanticized as like men are kind of the gangsters and, and that's kind of like in some weird way, it's kind of like cool or like yeah. acceptable, but then yeah, women are kind of portrayed as like oh, the behaviors women. that happen, mm. you know, are not cool. Let's say that. And, and then, yeah, I've heard lots of my friends as well and just kind of what you're describing, saying that it just makes it that extra layer more challenging to come and share that stuff with people and the shame that comes along with it. Yeah, you know. yeah, I totally. And also the behaviours that sort of come with that as well. Like you, yeah. so there's a lot of extra shame. Yeah. And then there's that um, because, you know, I, I've, I've always felt very independent. I lost all of my independence. Mm. Um, that drug really did erode that independence. I lost, I, I was so flimsy. I had no core. Like I had no, I had no idea who I was. Like I couldn't, I wasn't on the ground. Like I wasn't on the ground. I was so sad and lost and I just couldn't, it was just literally like everything was. And then, so whatever anyone would say to me, that was my, that was became my person. It was literally like I was sucked out through that process. There was not, there was not, no, there was no one there, you know? Mm. Um, and that was scary to navigate, not yeah. knowing who I was or I couldn't, I couldn't navigate. And then just chaos started happening. Just always, you know, there was just, it was like, it was like the black cloud was all over me, you know? And I just had chaos just like coming at me all the time. Like I couldn't do walk anywhere without there be some sort of drama and, very dark, dark yeah. energy. Um, anyway, I remember a guy saying, "You're just as you're just a second away from becoming an escort or a stripper or something." And I was like, "What? Like, yeah. shit!" Uh, if he's saying that, and he was like, "You've got a serious drug problem," I was like, "If this guy is saying I have a drug problem, <laughs> look at him," and he's saying that about me. Oh my God, Father Green. So that actually really helped because it really, I remember it was like, and I just thought that's it. I can't do this anymore. Like yeah. I cannot do this. Mm. Um, so I asked for help and I, it was my birthday and um, yeah, like I need, I need help. And a friend was like, you need to go to rehab. And she kind of cut me off on that day and probably the best thing that, she could have, have ever done for me in conjunction with it the exact same day that guy saying to me and I just that was I didn't even think rehab was an option mm. um, because then I went to rehab and then there's all the stigma about rehab you know yeah which I'd which I'd like I was like I don't want to be a person from rehab <laughs> <laughs> so, so like, yeah but um it's really funny that you say that and I forget that but the process of like 
not just rehab, but just kind of deciding to, well, I guess rehab, but I just deciding to do some sort of like addiction treatment is really weird. Like, yeah. Cause like, I was like you just, everything was like completely fucked. But then there was like people around me that I thought were way worse. And I, I mm. almost thought that like, I sort of <laughs> compared to some of the people around me, you know, I didn't really have, that bad of a drug problem you know what i mean because they were all like using heroin and like overdosing and every day and all this stuff and like i don't know i was and then when i kind of even when to some of those people when i said that like i was going to rehab they kind of were like what the fuck yeah same they're like (laughs) you're not a proper you're not a proper user (laughs) that's what i thought i didn't think i was a proper user either i know i don't have a problem and when I look back on it, I just think, fucking hell, how crazy is that? That you can kind of get to that mental... Because then now I tell people my story and like they start fucking crying or something. And I'm like, Jesus. Mm, <laughs> absolutely. Cool. Yeah. No, it's interesting. So, so what was that whole process like? Oh. Going to rehab, making that decision? Well, my fa- I, told my, <laughs> I told my family. They knew. But I told my family and it was like, <laughs> gutter rat you know like and I did and they're like no you don't need to go to rehab just detox at home and I was like I think I do need to go so anyway luckily went um but trying to find the rehab to go to is really hard and trying to navigate and this is something I'm really passionate about is Mm. that where do you get the information that's right yeah where is that where is that where is that um central database of the information of the private the public the like the options to go to there's nothing so Mm. trying to google places to go and and like oh i'd say like oh there's a yoga retreat rehab in bali and my parents like we're not sending you to a retreat i'd like to go to bali to a retreat as well yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) anyway um (laughs) went to rehab i found that it was um went to one here in melbourne and it was really it was it was the best thing i could have done because it really just I, I, I did two weeks of detox um, mm. prior to going. Yeah. And I went and I... Like I went at in, home or in a centre? Yeah. yeah. At home. Um, so I'm glad that I went in with two weeks, a bit more clarity. So I wasn't just asleep for the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I bought my art books, my interior design books, my, you know, all of this stuff. And then I remember... Um, without like tooting my horn or anything. But I remember someone who looked through all my bags was like, this is weird. We never see anyone that come in with interests. This is really good. This is really good. I'm really like happy to see this. Um, and that, I, that always stuck in my mind because I was like, interests, hobbies. This yeah. is why, like, this is, this is recovery. You know, it's about getting back to finding that heaven on earth, whatever that is, whatever that looks like for you. And that's why I was like, Ooh, because I'd had probably the two week clean time. I was like, oh, what do I? Well, now I can't use the drugs. What? What? What do I like? Who is Lily? Like, who am I? Yeah. Okay. I used to love drawing bugs, and you know, I used to love reading poetry, and I used to have all of this, you know, richness in my life. Yeah. Where did that go? Yeah. It went. You know, when I got sad, it went. Yeah. And when I found the drugs, so I bought all of those in, and um it was really nice to have that space to start exploring that side of myself again. Mm. Um, All of my interior design books and I got really inspired by colors and textures. And, um, and then I was doing the group and I had a connection with people there and Mm. that was really great. And then started doing the therapies and started getting less confused. And I remember working out, um, we did a thing. What are your values? What are your core values? Yeah. I was like, I don't have any. I had no core values left. Yeah. Like I didn't know. I didn't have any. That was like that part of me that was gone. So I had mm. no pillar to then um, or compass to then frame myself. So yeah. I had to literally rebuild the person that I wanted to be, the people that I was inspired by and pull in all of these different attributes and mm. just rebuild myself. And yeah. like you like you said, it, it's really weird. Like when you go and do it, because uh, I guess for a lot of people, and it sounds like you're the same. Even though your addiction might have not been that full blown like it was at the end, you're kind of like partying pretty big time 
in those early sort of teen years anyway mm. and you're like forming some of those habits and a lot of that's the time when you do form a lot of that kind of self-identity mm-hmm. and all that stuff normally so by the time like you said by the time you get to this whole big bang moment and have to kind of face yourself and all that you go fuck who am i like what yeah what's going on here <laughs> yeah and yeah. who who have i ever been yeah and i think that i really didn't I didn't know at, you know, mid twenties, I had no idea who I was. I, cause I'd been the, I'd been whatever I, I'd always been looking out at whatever I was getting a response to, you know, if I was yep. being bubbly and happy, okay, that's the bubbly and happy Lily I have to be, or, you know, um, mm. there's no room for sad Lily or the, to feel, you know, like it was always these things that I was interpreting, like mind reading everyone else to be 100%. the person. Um, and I remember that at the first, um, while I was probably still using, I went to an NA meeting. Mm-hmm. I actually, my dad and I went and um, nice. <laughs> it was really, yeah, I, I kind of needed him to see like, this is a thing. And the little the daughter is like really, really struggling. And I remember going and just, it was all of those similarities. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe I was hearing everyone saying, how I felt. I was like, what? I thought I was the only person in the world that had these feelings or yeah, yeah. I could never articulate it. And then it was, that was kind of a really big thing for me. And it was, um, I, I think big for my dad and I, anyway, it, that was when I realized, okay, this is a thing. This is something that needs, and that's probably was what made me then look into rehab for sure. Yeah. Um, so I found the rehab thing. It really brought up a lot, but then mm-hmm. you're there for 30 days. Yeah. And then you go and then you leave. And um, I was doing 12 um, step programs. Mm-hmm. And, but I wanted to go back to work and mm. I wanted to move out of home. And yeah. I wanted to like just go, go, go. And it wasn't, that wasn't really what was recommended. Mm. So I did all of that. And to be honest, I think that that was my, I mean, it's hard to know because I did relapse, but. For me, I needed to do that mm. for myself, for my self-worth. I needed to go and be um, participating in society. You know, I really needed to be yeah. doing my creativity stuff. And I, I started with um, work experience in an interior design firm. And it was amazing because I was Lily. Mm. You know, I wasn't Lily with an addiction. I was just like me. And I could be seen as me. And that's, yeah. they saw that. And I got really nurtured, got offered a job straight away. And I just kept getting further and further and further in the business. And I was just li- like, it was like a dream for me. Like I'd never mm. studied interior design and it was just, it was just amazing. Like just the, the growth. Um, yeah. And I was feeling so, I really felt like I had a purpose. I think purpose is huge, huge, mm. huge, huge. Um, and I could start, I I could start saving for a place. I hadn't had a home for three years. Mm. Um, and I remember when I got that bond together and that rent together for, to move into my new place, that was just like, yeah, that was like, this is why, um, recovery is awesome. Anyway, the whole thing was to create my heaven on earth. Mm. Um, whatever that looked like. Um, I wanted to be able to laugh without being intoxicated. I wanted yeah. to be able to actually be happy. Something I'd never really felt in my life before, like pure happiness. Yeah. I'd felt like moments of laughter or good of joy, but I'd never felt that like okay. I'd never felt okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, all of the um past like um traumas and stuff started I hadn't really, I hadn't, I hadn't remembered the sexual assault by this point, but there was all of this darkness that was sort of mm. coming up. And I remember being very alone because I still didn't have a core friendship group. Um, yeah. You know, I'd lost all, I'd lost my friends and um, not just sort of that, the shame as well. Like, you know, there was, it was just, I didn't really, I, I knew that I hadn't found my core group yet. Yeah. Um, and so I was very alone. Um, and I remember getting quite, and this is in recovery, getting a bit suicidal. Yeah. Um, and 
I then got put on antidepressants and then they made me worse. And then I just stopped. And the only thing, and I knew that, um, so then I, 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 this is, I remember picking up against my will, like again, picking up against my, I didn't want to use meth and I started using it. Wow. And yeah. um, I was just like, what am I doing? I've got my life, you know, and I just kept using, using, but I didn't feel suicidal anymore. I didn't feel anxiety anymore. And I was like, okay, I'm literally, so I just started self-medicating, only using small amounts. Yeah. I got, um, I, I, I was like, okay, this is, I'm fucked. Like, this is fucked. Like, I'm really, this is so scary. I'm still pretending to everyone that I'm sober. Yeah. Going to meetings, probably saying I'm sober. I don't know if I was going to meetings anymore. But um, that old madness. And then um, uh, I remembered um, about South Pacific Private. And mm. I knew that there was if you get private health insurance, you could have a two month, like to, for psychiatric cover, you could get two months of like leeway. Like you had to wait two months loading time yeah. or whatever it was. And then you could go. So I remember at this point calling all of the local public rehabs, calling all the like um, community centers. I went and got um, counseling and because I was only using small amounts, I wasn't a bad enough drug addict to go to warrant going to rehab. So um, I remember this one day just being like told no, no, no from all of these places. I'd done extensive, extensive research. Then I got home and in the letterbox was like, got a drug problem? Call this number. I was like, <laughs> call the number. And they're like, so I'm going to come down to Melbourne, pick you up. And I said, I, how much does it cost? Like pick a number, any number, tens and 20,000 was $30,000. Yeah. But we are the best and we can, I'll come down to Melbourne. We'll go to the bank. We'll get you a credit card. We'll get you a loan and we'll get you. Really? Say. Yeah. I was like, do you think I'm stupid? Like, no way. No. Really? But, That's what they said. Yep, 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 yep. They called me every two hours at me, at me. Come on, we can come and help you. This will, this will be the answer. This is the answer. Fucking I was hell. just like, you, you demons. Like, no, no, no. That's crazy. I, yep. Like... That's crap. Like, so don't get me wrong. I know there's some fucking dodgy stuff and I'm passionate about that too, I, but I've never heard that. <laughs> That's like full on. Yeah. I was like, is this a message from God? I was like, no, this is just, <laughs> just Bad praying on camping. the week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it took every strength of mine not to, oh, where do you live? We'll be there now. We're driving down. No. Jesus. Anyway, so... Um, I then called Boopa and got on private health insurance and then I knew I had two months. So in that two months, I was like, I just have to survive. I just have to survive. I just can't lose my job. and I just can't lose what I've worked for. I can't lose the respect of my family. I just have to do this on my own and get by. If South Pacific doesn't work, I may as well die because I just cannot live with this, with this anymore. Like I just, if this yeah. doesn't work, it's my last chance at life. So I did two months and it was just, I tried to sleep every night. I tried to eat three meals a day. I tried to just uh, maintain my weight and tried to, mm. but meanwhile using, but it was just that madness of like, okay, oh, I've got to make sure I've got enough. Like I started using a bit of heroin and started, you know, make, make sure I've got that when I go to sleep and that, you know, da, 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 da. everything was so, it's, it's yeah. just that thing again. Um, Luckily, I packed my house up, told work I was going to, yo going to a yoga retreat for a month. Um, and I went to South Pacific. Um, and, yeah, I was just crazy for it to work. So I was like, I thought that my counsellor was too soft, too nice. So I tried to go to the manager and tried to get, I did a full Karen on them and tried to, <laughs> tried to go <laughs> For anyone that doesn't live in Melbourne that's listening to this, um, a Karen is, there was this, there was this woman, anyway, it's probably a bit of a digress story, but there was this woman in the lockdowns that was complaining on the news about not being able to walk around her streets of Brighton 
uh, or she'd done all the streets of Brighton. She um, was bored. And she was bored. And she needs to go to the Botanical Gardens. And, yeah. bro- and bro- for anyone listening that doesn't know Melbourne, Brighton is like the probably one of the, the most or if not the most expensive suburb that you can live in in Melbourne. <laughs> but like I just went, I just went, I just went like a rogue beast, you know, I just wanted it so badly that I just thought, no, I know best. And it was that control freak thing. And I was like, no, no, yeah. no this is my last chance of life. I need to make sure that... So yeah. I'd have like meetings with them all and I was just yeah. like trying to schmooze my way through everything. Anyway, um, I was in like a panic attack for those four weeks. It was, it was awful. I tried to leave a few times, which is not like me. <laughs> I wanted to just like get it done, but I just was just, it was too much to deal. It was so yeah. intense. Um, and they really wouldn't let me speak to boys. They'd pull away all my friendships. I wasn't allowed to use humour as a coping defense. So they'd pull away all of my defense mechanisms. So I was just like, <laughs> so, um, but then they put me in a program called changes and that really did do the job. Um, I think, and that was really getting to those core belief systems from, um, from childhood. Um, and those th- beliefs I had about myself that I didn't even know I had that were really, um, running the show. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I left there and um, I relapsed once, maybe maybe three months later. Um, but then from then, I just I, I did um, I went back to twelve step fellowships for a year. I said I'll do a year in. I said I'd do a year of sobriety and a year of um, like no no alcohol, nothing, mm. and I'll do the steps um, and I'll really work the program. And I did. I went to, um, am I allowed to say which ones I went to? Yeah. Yeah, it's all fine. Okay, I went to NA. I don't know why I've still got that, like, can't talk about uh, it now. We can talk about that. It's funny. <laughs> it's funny. I know. I know. It's, not, like, oh, it's weird. Yeah. Can I talk about it? Anyway, went to Narcotics Anonymous. And it was really um, full on being a newcomer female mm. at Narcotics Anonymous because it's very male oriented. So I found it very, um, and then I, my sexual assault trauma started coming up. Mm. And so I got very triggered at every meeting because of the, um, the nature of it. Mm. Um, and I couldn't work out if people actually wanted to be my friend or if they wanted more or, and that was, a, that was a very similar trait to what happened with the person I trusted when I was uh, uh, abused because yeah. it was that not knowing. So I, I, I went to um, Alcoholics Anonymous yeah. and um, found that there were older people that could, that were or older. I don't know. It was just a different, um, different vibe, different vibe. Um, it was more about the spirituality side of the program, which is what I, I did resonate with. Um, anyway, I, um, I just didn't gel with the program. It wasn't yeah. for me. I found it really depressing. Mm. I found it really depressing and having to talk about, I just didn't really understand why you needed to focus on the dark all the time. Mm. I just was very much like, it's happened. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not me forever. Like I just always knew that if I got to the underlying problem, I wouldn't have to react by using. Yeah. I don't know. I was like, if I create all of these great parts in my life, like, Mm. And I have beautiful friends, a beautiful relationship with my family, go out to nature, do my yoga, do my dancing, um, be creative, you know, all of these um, ingredients to a beautiful life. I won't want to escape by using drugs. I've got too much to lose. Like I don't have time mm. to do that shit. I don't, I don't actually want to do that, you yeah. know? So that was just my logic behind it. And it didn't really match with... Um, AAs and I didn't like to keep talking about and I didn't like felt I felt dark and I felt shamey and I felt like I was taking on all this dark energy and it was just like focusing on that was my interpretation that was my experience I know that it really works for some people but I just felt Mm. I felt scared I felt like I didn't have any power I felt like I couldn't I felt like I had to I was I had no power over anything in my life yeah and I just like but I do have power in my life. I don't really, I, I do. I'm, I'm, 
I mm -hmm. have got that power back. Um, and I think I was also doing a lot of, I was doing every modality under the sun, kinesiology, <laughs> um, energy healing, Reiki, this, 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 like I was doing it all. You wanted um, to be better. <laughs> yeah, like fix, I didn't, I didn't even fix. Anyway, um, I finally like left and I thought I was going to die. I was like, yeah, this has been amazing. Thank you. But I'm going to go. And I remember being so scared. It, so is fun scared. it is funny, isn't it? It's like a, and I want to talk about all this more because it's so interesting to hear your perspective on it. And it's, it's kind of cool. It's something that we're really interested in doing with this podcast is not sort of telling people, because this is what I find happens is that, you know, like you kind of get into recovery and it's a, the reason why you go in is because like you said, you want to create your own heaven on earth. You want a good life. Like that's what recovery should be or is. And then somehow it kind of morphs into like some, something else about like how you do recovery and this is the right way to do it. And this is what mm. it is. And you kind of get lost. And, and like you said, it's funny, like, you might not be like connecting with the certain like modality, but then like particularly in 12 step fellowships for all the good stuff that happens, there is this kind of narrative in there that happens is that basically if you don't go to meetings for the rest of your life, <laughs> that you're going to fucking relapse and die, die, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, you're going to die. Without us, you're dead. <laughs> I believed it, but I was like kind of felt the separation like this real it was almost like I was living in this cage mm. and the rest of the world was going on and then I was stuck in this cage of 12-step fellowship yeah and I couldn't I couldn't um sort of really like I couldn't go out for drinks with my work I, I did all of that mm. but I felt like it was them and me kind of like yeah yeah and I yeah. felt like I could never be part of that when yeah. I was part of the 12 step fellowship. Yeah. It was wrong to be out and socializing with drinks around and that sort of mm. thing. Anyway, um, I left and it's been amazing. Like honestly, You're okay. I, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm alive. <laughs> and I'm actually really happy. Like yeah. I'm really happy. And I think that's the thing. You can be a dry drunk. You can be, you know, you can be sober. Mm. If you're not happy, what's the point? Yeah, that's right. That exactly. <laughs> you just hit the nail on the head. So it's really interesting. Um, so, so, so tell us like what you've learned about recovery or how do you define recovery now? And like kind of go into that sobriety thing and how you have come to understand that and mm. how that intersects with like recovery. Because I think it's a really interesting conversation and, and something that I want to talk more to people about, um, you know, because, yeah, it's just, it's just a funny thing. Like, there's so many great things about the recovery community and how it's been developed and that really yeah. helps people. But then there's so many things as well that I think are really, like, negative and, and like, don't help people also. Absolutely. Well, yeah. for recovery for me, I think that it has to be looked at as a individual it's very like recovery needs to be tailor-made for each person yeah and i think that there is no one size fits all but i think that the fundamental pillars with jack you and i sort of bonded over was our exact ideals about the pillars of what recovery needs to look like and yeah. what, what, what underpins everything mm. is that connection and it yeah. is that um I think it's the connection to something greater than yourself, definitely. Mm. And that's what is um, said in, um, in the 12 step fellowships. It is that mm. connection to something greater that it's also comes down to trust, trusting the process, trusting that everything is happening as it's happening, but you have to, you have to make it happen. Mm. Like it's that real fine line between you can't let go. You have to, you have to make it happen. You have to visualize your life and you have to kind of have an idea of, what it is that it is that um it is visualization it is what you for me i i could see really clearly how i wanted my life yeah say in one year or two years or three i just i just wanted purity mm. i wanted ease i wanted beautiful um 
friends. I wanted laughter. I wanted a successful creative job. I wanted purpose. I wanted, you know, and I wanted a good life. I wanted a good (laughs) life. I just wanted like a nice life. And I wanted to, I wanted to like myself. You know, I really wanted to um, be friends with myself. So I think recovery, you'll make it happen if you, if you want it. Like, and I think like if you, if you can see it, Mm. There's no, there's no way that you can't get it. I think in life, like if you want something, you're going to get it. Like there's just no chance of Like there's just, there's no coincidences. Like it just, things just, things just come. So I, I, my, my biggest one is trusting the process and being clear on what you want is a huge one. Yeah. So, so I guess it is that connection to something greater than yourself. It's that connection to, when you've got people around you, like good friends and good family and good support networks, you, the world is your oyster. You've got that backbone. You've got that support. People mm. are there holding you. So you can then launch into life. You can mm. then um, take those risks and people will, be, like, people will believe in you. You know, you've got that. And, and also people's, when you're building your idea of yourself again, you're rebuilding yourself in recovery. You can see yourself through the eyes of others, you know. Yeah. You see yeah. these incredible people who want to be your friend. Yeah. So you're like, well, I must be pretty fucking awesome if you know. <laughs> um, and then I think um, it's that connection to purpose. Yeah. So always tuning into your heart, you know, always tuning in, always, you know, and I, I got... Um, you know, like it, it, the recovery has been like hard as hell, you know, yeah. it's been really hard, but it was from having these supports that I, I you know, I, I had to get like a tribe of people before I got my friends, you know, like, as I said, every kinesiolo- kinesiology, this person, this person, this person. And I was literally just working to make money to try and get this team of people around me that could support me. Yeah. on an emotional, um, spiritual and physical level. So mm. it is about body, mind, spirit. Mm. If each day you're trying to do something or each moment of each day, if you're tuning into your body, mind, spirit, if you're doing something in the morning and if you're, I think, the bookmarks of the day, you know, if you have a morning routine and an evening routine, whatever happens in between, kind of, it, it, it matters, but if you've got that stability morning and night, it, you can rebuild your neural pathways. You're mm. calming your um, central nervous system. You're also just, you know, like so meditation or exercise or both journaling, reading, mm. doing something just for your, um, yeah, for those aspects of yourself, I think is that's, I've always said body, mind, spirit, body, mind, spirit, making sure that you're trying to connect all three of them. Mm. love it no and we um and and that's what uh, it's been really conscious for me like as i said at the start we've been doing the new website and all that sort of stuff and i've just been thinking about some of that stuff and yeah like just nailing it down to like what what is recovery well it's just having a good life so you just Mm. you want to be happy you want to feel happy and and you sort of want peace and contentment across all your life domains, you know, and that's Absolutely. kind of, if you got that, then you're pretty happy. <laughs> Absolutely. And you don't need to like go and, you know, harm yourself with drugs or some other addictive pattern to kind of make it work. So how do you understand, like in that whole recovery piece, like how do you understand sobriety? Sobriety. So that's an, it's an interesting one. Um, so I, I started um, drinking here and there after the uh, after AA. Yeah. And it, what was it like having your first kind of drink? You know how you said when you left and you felt like you were going to die when you made that decision that you were going to go and have a, a drink. I felt so guilty. I felt <laughs> so guilty. Oh my god, my clean time. Yeah. My number of months. You know, back like day one. Um, but then I was like, I don't know, after a couple of weeks, I think I had like maybe two drinks in two weeks and I didn't want any more. That's interesting. That's yeah. not what I thought was going to happen. 
just bracing myself for that really bad relapse, you know, bracing myself for that really bad relapse. And mm. it just never came. Yeah. Never came. Um, yeah. So like very open and upfront, I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sober. Yeah. But, um, and I don't, I don't suggest that for everyone. I, I, I just will do that myself because I feel like I'm so in tune with myself that if I feel a hundred percent, my addictive tendencies come back in. Like, you mm. know, like the, those little, um, oh, you can have one more or, oh, you know, like things that sober me, you know, like there's little ticks that sometimes happen and I, if I, I pull myself up, you know, like I'll go, okay, let's do, so then I'll, then I'll do no time drink, you know, then I'll, I'll make sure that I don't drink for a while, especially if I'm re- like, you know, cause I get anxiety. Mm. So if I know that my anxiety is really flaring, I won't go there because yeah. I just don't want to risk it, you know? Mm. Um, so I just always, but like, I, I just like, I've, I've got a lot of fond associations with, you know, drinking beautiful Italian wine with my godparents or, you know, like just like, I love, mm. I just love like a beautiful lunch and a wine and a, you know, like I, yeah. and I, I just was not willing to, not have that yeah because that's well, what creates richness but that's just isn't something i like in my life yeah. so i'm gonna do it so and i think this is the fundamental thing that you know i always work through with people when i'm working with them and you know that we do through the program or whatever you, you almost have to like not only help people overcome their own demons but then overcome like this kind of especially if they've been through other services before, like this whole mm. kind of programming around like what recovery is like. Yeah. So, so for instance, I was like, I had this guy the other day, I was talking to him and he's like, he's like to me, Oh, I want, I want, um, I really would like to be in like a relationship and kind of start to settle down and, you know, just start to like, look at that. But I know that I shouldn't get into a relationship for like the first 12 months of my recovery. And then I was just like, why? Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, well, because that's what they say that you should do. And I'm like, well, nah, not really. Like, let's hold on. Let's look at you. Like, okay. Like, so you got issues with drugs and alcohol. You definitely got like a bit of obsession around work, but like, have you ever had any issues with like relationships and stuff? No, not really. Well, I, like, I think that's an area of your life that you're okay. Might be different if you, yeah, had like codependency issues in the past or something. Maybe we might do something different. But for you, that's not a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, and like, it's kind of funny just like working against all that stuff. And it's almost like if you tell yourself something enough times, whether you rationally know that it's true or not, you start believing it. And that's why marketing works on us it's like mm. mcdonald's you know i know it's like terrible for you it increases your risk of cancer but every time i say mcdonald's ad i think oh, i could really go a burger because yeah absolutely like, hits on something subconscious so you know people have to be really careful when they like talking about recovery and just thinking about them and having a good life like what they're letting in and the belief systems and the belief systems <laughs> and so i think it comes down to and this is one thing that i really want to like drive home is ask why always ask why always question it always just tune in from yourself don't just Mm. listen to everything else go okay i'm not allowed to be in a relationship why is that okay i can understand the viewpoint but why why like does that apply to me yeah and always come from you like rather Mm. than and that's how you can grow your self-esteem is by getting a that's how you grow your relationship with yourself going okay well that's because we're so used to um i i guess a lot of us uh people who use are people pleasers so we kind of have that external thing we're not we don't know who we are so it is about going is that what i want mm. is this the life that i want is yes. it what life do i want and how do i do that so not listening to absolutely everything and just questioning it questioning mm. it does this apply for you does this make you happy yeah are you happy doing this does this resonate like does this feel right like tune into your gut feel 100 
And just to, just to explain to everyone listening, because I think it helps with like context. And, and if you've listened before, you've, you've probably heard me explain it. But the whole like kind of premise behind all of this is that addiction is essentially not so much about alcohol and drugs itself, because there's lots of people out there in the world. You just have to go and look at the extensive research mm. and stats done. The far majority of people in the world, let's just use alcohol, drink and do not have a problem with alcohol, right? So there's something else going on that fuels people's kind of fire. And, you know, definitely it's the negative belief systems, the negative emotional patterns, past traumas, outside stressful life events, whatever it is that kind of is like the fuel. Um, Mm. And when you add that fuel to the fire, which is say alcohol, then it has the potential to spark into like an addictive pattern. So if someone's so like myself, into the problem. That's right. That's yeah. right. And if you like someone like uh, myself or Lily, who kind of gets into like a, I, I've been calling them like addictive patterns now instead of like addiction. Yeah. And if you like someone like us that gets into those ingrained addictive patterns, it doesn't mean that you can't go back to being a normal person. The whole the whole purpose of kind of becoming sober is that so you can get a clear canvas to actually Mm. work through all that stuff that's built up underneath. And then once you clear that stuff that's underneath the fuel, then you can add the other stuff back in if you want to, um, because the fuel's not there to kind of explode it Mm. anymore and turn it into. Yeah, that's really true. Yeah. And that's kind of the premise behind it because I don't know, like there is this old school kind of thing that, it is a disease, like it's something that chemically happens in your brain and it's there forever. But maybe that's true and maybe that's true for some people, I don't know. Um, and that's the thing, there's not enough conclusive like evidence or research. It's a spe- there's a spectrum as well, like we just... That's right, that's right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe that's true for some people, but I've just met far too many people like Lily, other people, so many people that, have had significant like addiction problems, full on fucking lives with drugs and alcohol, and then just come back, done the work and got themselves right. And then they're just living as normal human beings. <laughs> you know what I mean? So normal. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, it's um as hard as it is for a lot of people to take on it, a lot of this like kind of does come back to that um, internal stuff around what are your belief systems? What's your identity? How do you think of yourself? You know, all that sort of stuff. And if you're constantly reinforcing to yourself that you're an addict, then you're, that you're an addict, that you're an addict, then that's what you are, isn't it? That's what you mm-hmm. become. <laughs> Even if you are sober for 10 years, you know, so yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. I get, I get passionate about that. It's, but it's exciting because I've seen it just like explaining that to people and people really getting it it just transforms their whole life and actually yeah. moves them into actual recovery where they're happy like yourself and enjoying what they're doing because there is yeah. a lot of people that are sober that are kind of doing this institutionalized way of recovery that they think's right. And they just fucking hate it. And they're not happy. <laughs> recovery is action based. Yeah. Action, 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 action. And I, I, that's, you have to have it. It might be the smallest mini moments but there are so many minuscule moments that make up your life Mm. and make up the direction of your life and it's choices and moments and like choices in those moments and when you're doing the positive action Mm. you've got no other way than just going to the light and just life just kind of opening for you as i you know like it's that saying when you're in addiction life happens to you when you're in this mode life happens for you it just keeps opening and opening and opening. 100%. I couldn't script the stuff that's, that's, you know, happens now. You know, I still struggle with um, anxiety and all those sort of things of why I was escaping it. But I, yeah, it's, it, my life is open and full. And mm. I, you know, I'm still a human that has the suffering and all that sort of thing, but I'm, I'm, I'm the most alive I've ever been. Yeah, 100%. And it's kind of like... Um, like another thing that I've been banging on about, which you touched on, which I thought was like really interesting and, it, and it's awesome that you have that self-awareness. Um, and I really think it should be kind of put into like a public health kind of message around mental health and alcohol mm. and drugs <clears throat> is that just like 
you know, we have to start thinking about alcohol and drug use or mental health like we do physical health, mm. you know? So it's kind of like a good way I find that people can think about, you know, whether they should have a drink that night or whatever is like, it's like if it was a cold night, like it was here last night in Melbourne and it kind of gets down to five degrees or whatever for your physical health, it's recommended that you don't go outside without a fucking jumper on because mm. you're going to catch a fucking cold. Right. So just like there's recommendations, like common sense, things like that around physical health, just like you were saying, it should be the same with like your internal health if you've just lost your job or if you can feel there's like anxiety going on in your life or if you're extra stressed or whatever it is, maybe don't go out and have drinks on that Saturday night because that's the fuel that's going to set that fire alight. But absolutely, if everything's kind of okay in your life, then you're going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Awesome, mate. Hey, it's a really, it's a really interesting story. Just like, just lastly, like what would be its stereotypical question? Um, mm. I feel like I could like just talk to you forever about this stuff, <laughs> but because um, I really relate and vibe with mm. what you're saying. But you've mentioned a lot of stuff, and and it's kind of hard not to because there's so many great things that like the recovery community and the existing recovery structures if you want to call it or networks there's like amazing things that that does to help so many people yeah but but there's also like we've been saying there's a lot of like drawbacks to it that are really counterproductive and make it really hard for people to kind of recover as well what would you say to people listening to this that are just kind of unsure they want to go about things a little bit differently like what's so the like best in thing? in um so say they're in recovery in a different recovery program maybe yeah maybe yeah. maybe they've just entered rehab they're not vibing with it maybe they're wanting to go to rehab maybe they're mm. maybe they've been in recovery for a little while and thinking about doing something doing it differently to what they're being told you know like what would you how would you suggest that people go about it i think that it is about um put, putting mini steps in place to sort of infiltrate back in uh, it's really hard with COVID actually yeah how are you going so my big thing is um finding those sort of networks outside of maybe um the recovery world so like if yeah. you can and this is going to be something that and I can't even imagine what it's like being in early recovery or being um fuck it would be hard in it? recovery recovery like sobriety recovery in during these COVID times it's such an isolating um time mm. um but i i i'm a strong believer in um getting those strong not strong but starting to sort of chip away at some social ex external social networks yeah um where I don't know. I found for me that was where the joy started coming back into my life. Like the yeah. joy, the real positive, funny me came mm. out when I started going out into different social networks, you things, you know, like I really found my people when I did mm. that. And that mm. has helped my recovery more than anything, more than anything. Um, other advice I would give would just be, um, just getting back to what makes you feel that um, the joy like what are those little mini moments that, that can bring you the joy is it um, is it going and picking people's roses from their garden or naughty at night or whatever it might be like yeah, yeah, what are those yeah, little yeah. things that bring you that buzz and that lightness um, so I guess in this time, it's really getting back to that relationship with yourself. Um, yeah. I think always, I think after rehab and stuff, it's very easy also to um, forget about your uh, mental health. Like you kind of think, oh, I'm fixed. I've done so much um, psychology or whatever it might be. But I really recommend having a person that you see, especially during this time, a counsellor, a psychologist, finding that person for you because a lot of times I've dropped off from seeing people but mm. I think I like always need someone there 
Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I think you're right. Like having someone there to help you sort through like big stuff is really helpful. But then also setting up things in your life, like whether they be routines or activities mm. that genuinely but like a coach, even like a like like a recovery coach or just someone that can help you with the basics, basic rela- relationship stuff. After uh, you know, in reco- in recovery, yeah. is like relationships are hard as hard as the addiction yeah. you know the addictive um things so um knowing how to you know and then triggers will flare and you know just someone to help navigate that mind that everyone you know that monkey mind that crops up in recovery awesome. yeah love it hey it was awesome to talk to you thanks for doing it i know it's uh it's it's harder than people think to kind of sit here and you know be your soul in a sense and, and talk about this stuff. So really appreciate it. I know it's going to um, help a lot of people get some perspective on their life and things like that. So you're a star, mate. If, um, Thanks if anyone, if, uh, if you, you're kind of doing like some public health work at the moment in the AOD space, are you still doing anything? If people wanted to reach out and talk to you, I don't know if you're doing yeah, that, so um, I, um, where can they find you? If, so, if not, just tell them no. <laughs> so I'm still doing, so I work um, my day jobs in, um, yeah, the harm reduction sector. Yeah. Um, but it is, it is something that, I, as I mentioned before, I was doing um, recovery coaching with Connection Based Living. Yeah. So I, I made the decision to um, put that on hold just for a few weeks while this COVID second wave came so that I wasn't burning out and doing all that sort of thing. But it is something I'm, the recovery coaching counseling is something that um, I, in maybe a few weeks, I'll be back to it. Awesome. So whether you want to check out connection based living or um, yeah, just if you've already gone through recovery and you just need someone to speak with. um, Yeah. I do my counseling recovery coaching as well. So it's um it's uh i've got should i give my telephone number or i don't know we'll no, no, don't, don't, don't give your telephone <laughs> number we'll work we'll work something out and we'll put it in the um we'll put it in the show notes. i've got an email address that's right we'll put it in, we'll put it in the show notes <laughs> <laughs> can you delete that <laughs> <laughs> no <I'll>, <laughs> uh, Jake. um awesome. hey, thanks for having me Jack. Thanks, thanks for coming on mate i appreciate it